Hello, good morning. Today, our guest is Professor Carl Frey. Hello, Carl. How are you doing? Not too bad. Good to be with you. Carl, it is great to be with you. Do you know why? Because I love your article. I cite it profusely on my show, and it is titled, How Culture Gives the U.S. an Innovation Edge Over China. This is a masterpiece, Carl. I really enjoy it. But before we talk about your article, I'm going to read a brief snippet under the caption, Innovation and Individualism. Scholars have only recently begun to pay attention to the striking variation in psychology across societies. In his remarkable new book, The Wordest People in the World, Harvard professor Joseph Henrich notes that people in the West evolved to become particularly individualistic and pro-social beginning in the Middle Ages. According to Henrich, their path to prosperity began with the Roman Catholic Church and its family policies, such as bans on cousin marriage, which inadvertently dissolved kingship institutions and, and made the Europeans increasingly free, both relationally and residentially. I think that this is an important starting point. And let me continue briefly. Similarly, the psychologist Richard Nisbet has found that Euro-Americans are more analytical while East Asians think more holistically, focusing less on individuals and more on the larger web of relationships that bind them together. And I must say, Carl, Richard Nisbet and his co-authors, they did a recent paper replicating these findings for normal East Asians, not just college students. That's good to know. So I need to catch up on that paper. Yes. So, Joseph, in your paper, you also discuss the relationship between rice farming and wheat farming. Why would rice farming affect personality traits? Well, so the basic idea is that culture evolves uh, with um, different modes of production. So, for example, if uh, you look at herding societies, you will find that those societies today still tend to be relatively individualistic. If you look at societies where people used to hunt whales, which requires some collaboration, you tend to find that those societies are more collectivistic relative to societies where people hunted smaller animals. If you look at places that were exposed to agriculture earlier, which required more collaboration, those places tend to um, be more collectivistic. And rice farming tends to be particularly associated with a collectivism because it required people to build quite and elaborate irrigation systems, which in then sort of reinforced uh, these cultural traits. Yes, as you write, societies that sprang up around rice farming are still more interdependent and fiercely loyal. Something psychological testing has shown is common in other rice growing East Asian nations, such as Japan and Korea. That's right. And I think that's also explained as a number of scholars have uh, argue this as well, is that um, it makes those societies more capable of coordinating complex production tasks, which is important for industrial catch-up, which is something that I argue in that article as well. Exactly. And this is another part of the puzzle, Carl. In China, regions that historically specialize in wheat became more individualistic and they're also more innovative. Exactly. So there's a lot of variation within society. So often when we, you know, compare, you know, the United States to China, we have glossed the fact that there is a lot of variation within the United States. Some places are more individualistic in the United States than others. And the same is true within China. And, and overall, we find that places that are historically more exposed to rice farming today still are more collectivistic. And as a consequence of that, people seem to be less willing to deviate from social norms, which is important for especially uh, radical innovation. Um, it also means that more collectivistic societies tend to be more suspicious 
uh, of immigrants. And we all know that, you know, uh, the free flow of information and people is very important for innovations. Uh, in particular, you know, immigration has been a key driver of technological dynamism in the United States for um, over a century. Conversely, if you look at Japan, for example, it's a very homogenous population, uh, very little um, immigration. Uh, collectivism tends to reinforce uh, less open attitudes towards um, immigrants, which also means that, you know, there is less a uh, flow of information or fewer sporadic interactions happening across cultures, which tends to uh, be very important and um, for innovation, a variety of studies um, show. Uh, Joe Henrik, who you mentioned earlier, has coined this phrase, the collective brain. I think that's an excellent way um, of putting it. Um, scholars have long uh, recognized that you know openness uh, and larger social networks are highly important to innovation, um, and collectivist cultural traits tend to um, often favor um, um, the in-group uh, at the expense of the out-group, um, which uh, in turn means that um, it um, makes it harder to wire the collective brain. Exactly. But this point is also a, a key observation, and it is in relation to the wheat sections in China. And you, and you right. Those regions remain more innovative to this day, judging by the number of patents they take out, though they are still not as individualistic as their counterparts in the West. That's absolutely right. So the key point that Johan makes is that we are WEIRD, and WEIRD is an acronym for Western Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic. And on most scales, we stand out, for example, as being particularly individualistic. Um, that's true of Europe in general. It's true of the United States in particular. Exactly. Where, where culture has a preference for long-term innovation, long-term orientation, and delayed gratification. So Robert McRae and his co-author several years ago, they did a study noting that Westerners are higher in openness and individualism when compared to people from Asia. I think that's absolutely right. And you can see, and what Henrik shows his paper is that where kinship structures have been particularly persistent, people tend to favor the kin, they favor the in-group, um, and they are more draw more um, um, uh, clear distinctions between strangers and people they know. Um, and that in turn, as I mentioned earlier, uh, reduces the size of the collective brain, but also means that because you become more conformist, conformist to existing norms, it also means that you're less likely to deviate from those norms. So there are two things going on there. On the one hand, individualistic societies are less li uh, more likely to deviate from existing norms, which makes it more likely that we'll come up with more radical innovations. And on the other hand, individualistic societies are more open to strangers, which in turn increases the size of the collective brain. Exactly. And the, in Western societies, because people are individualistic, they tend to, to have a longer view of time. So delayed gratification is more evident in Western societies. And let me explain it in terms of investing. So research has shown that entrepreneurs who are highly involved in social projects their businesses tend to be less competitive because they are they are known to use resources to invest in social obligations instead of investing in capital formation. So recently, I was listening to some students on the radio, and these they're very young students. They live in a non-Western country in the Caribbean, and they were asked, "What what will you do if you get out of money?" And most of the students said. I am going to spend it or I will share it with my family. And my opinion is quite different. One, I'm older, so I have more experience. But even as a little boy, I was interested in business. If you get a win 
fall, you should invest it to create more wealth. When you create more wealth, you can splinter the resources. It is insensible to share the windfall with your family because in the long term, you will be worse off like your relatives. Investing to create more wealth makes all of us better. That's absolutely right. Yeah, so some, con some countries have a sharing culture versus a wealth creation culture. I don't have a problem with sharing, but sharing is a bit short term. When you think about long term wealth creation, you have more money to share in the future. No, I, I agree with that, obviously. You need to find the right uh, balance. You uh, need some current demand for people to innovate um, as well. Um, but it's absolutely true that delayed gratification plays a very important role in driving investment, which is important for growth and innovation. Yes, and I appreciate the, the work of Joseph. And so far, I'm quite elated that his work has been embraced by mainstream society because there's a new line of research in economics and it's quite quantitative arguing that the distribution of certain traits that induce economic development are not evenly distributed across the world and this can create a barrier to the diffusion of technology yes i mean the distinction i make in the piece is that you need to distinguish between different phases of development so if you're behind the world's technological frontier you can grow very quickly by adopting technologies conceived elsewhere and incrementally improving them. And you know, for production and incrementally improving innovation, um, collectivist traits can work quite well. So for example, if you have a factory, uh, you can't run it if nobody is willing to follow standardized and routinized procedures. Um, uh, conversely, uh, when you've caught up with the technological frontier and you need to grow, and uh, you, uh, when you need radical innovation to grow, uh, individualism uh, is more helpful because as we discussed earlier, uh, innovation very much depends on willingness to deviate. So production or the exploitation of existing technologies um, are, are not necessarily favored by the same set of cu uh, cultural traits and institutions as is innovation at the technological frontier. And if we look at you know, very broad patterns of development, I think this can help us understand that because we do know that since the great divergence, which began with the industrial revolution in Britain, uh, we haven't seen that much convergence, which is essentially what neoclassical uh, theory would predict. We actually seen, you know, very persistent patterns of growth in the West and not that much catch up with the exception of a set of countries in Southeast Asia, which have managed to catch up in extraordinary fashion precisely because they exhibit very significant levels of state capacity and because they have these collectivist cultural traits which allow them to produce and exploit uh, technologies perhaps more efficiently than anywhere else. Okay, Carl, and the, again, you are absolutely correct. Yes, East Asians are not as individualistic as Westerners, but compared to other groups in the rest of the world, they have an inherent advantage. One, a longer history of institutional complexity, literacy, and skills and skills training institutions like clans. The clans in Europe were more individualistic and allowed the easy diffusion of skills. In, in China, clans were governed by family, the, mainly the king group, but nonetheless, they, they existed and served a function. So I'm not surprised that East Asian countries are doing well because they have a longer duration of labor systems training and overall productivity. Exactly, and the long tradition of uh, bureaucratic uh, bureaucracy as well, which has been helpful in building up state capacity, which is important, you know, 
build high speed rail, for example, uh, I mean, the levels of state capacity you see not just in China, but also in Japan, uh, Korea, and so on, um, are extraordinary and they've been very persistent over time. Yeah, it's institutional complexity or what some people call genetic distance. And genetic, genetic distance is really a proxy for culture and some genetic variation, but we're not saying that there's a gene coding for development. This is not the argument being postulated by those who research on genetic distance. And I'm saying this for some of our guests, but look at Singapore, for example. Singaporeans are culturally and genetically similar to the Chinese. So even though Singapore and China are two separate countries, the Singaporeans, they have the institutional history of the Chinese. So, and Singapore is a brilliant case study of a successful catch-up country. Absolutely, and one uh, one reason China managed to close the gap so quickly as well, and one uh, very important uh, difference to, let's say, the Soviet Union, which actually tried to pursue many policies that China has as well, like special economic zones, for example, was set up in Vladivostok, but you know, didn't attract that many people uh, with skills and that brought technological knowledge. But it did in China. And one part of the, uh, um, one of the reasons for that is that China had roughly uh, 20 million migrants living in Taiwan, living in Hong Kong, living in Singapore, living in the United States, which when China opened up, were very eager to uh, move into these special economic zones, take advantage of the opportunities there, uh, bring with them technological knowledge uh, that they had acquired on the outside. And these ethnic ties uh, usually matter, right? William Carr at Harvard, for example, has shown that uh, ethnic ties are very important for technology transfer also between you know, people in the United States and their home countries, and it's particularly uh, pronounced among the Chinese. Patients and the wealth of nations. Patient countries are richer. Yes, East Asians are not as individualistic as Westerners, but they're patient people. So again, this is another reason why they have done so well. Exactly. Absolutely. And I think you can make the case, which uh, Henrik makes in this book as well, that people in East Asia actually have become more individualistic over the past uh, couple of decades, especially with the introduction of the one child policies and so on um, in China. Um, so culture is, you know, changing over time in all places, but patterns are very persistent and past dependent. Um, and that means that, you know, things like uh, rice agriculture still uh, affects people's behavior today. Uh, okay, so Professor Free, oh, do you, oh, Professor, we're on the topic of collectivism. Some people see collectivism as an impediment to innovation. There is a merit to this argument, but, but there is also a downside. Collectivism can promote innovation, but for collectivism to be successful, it must be nurturing the right traits. East Asians are collectivistic, but what do they value? They value work. So in, so in essence, their, their collectivism is premised on policies that can promote growth. So in, so in the 90s and 80s, people in South Korea and Taiwan were passionate about improving productivity and innovation. If you're going to be collectivistic, you should be collectivistic about the, the right policies. No, that's right. But you know, being hardworking and productive is not the same thing as being innovative, right? So, for example, you know, as an academic or an author or almost whatever you do, right? Um, to uh, come up with something new, you need to be tremendously unproductive uh, for some period of time, right? So let's say that I publish a paper as a tutorial student on the impact of robotics on labor markets in the United States. I could, you know, be tremendously productive by, you know, just replicating the same, same study for country after country, the, for the same thing for the UK and for Germany and uh, Italy, China, wherever. And I could produce a lot of papers quite easily that way, but there would be diminishing returns to each one, right? Each new paper would be less impactful uh, than the previous one. And so in order to, you know, think of something new, I you know, need to take some time off writing papers, explore, uh, you know, go to dinners, go to 
for meetings and conferences and, and try to collect new ideas and to um, develop what I next want to work on. And during that period of time, I'm not going to produce a lot. I'm going to be quite unproductive, but I'm going to lay the foundations for hopefully something more impactful to come. So I think, you know, these collectivist traits are very good at grinding down, you know, narrowly defined problems. They're very good at, you know, collaborative, teamwork, which tends to be more consensus seeking and therefore more uh, less radical, right? So for example, if you're in a larger group and um, you're less likely to, you know, just throw in some absurd idea you just thought of uh, being, you know, obviously aware that it might be ridiculed, right? So you're more likely to pursue uh, crazy ideas um, by yourself or, um, in a smaller group, and that is, you know, why we need to distinguish between, you know, different cultural traits having, you know, different comparative advantage in different stages of production, and that is indeed the the uh, argument I'm trying to make in the make in the article as well that you mentioned. Yes, and you also refer to the salience of unconventional thinking. So one study notes that native Canadians are higher in openness than Chinese, and the Chinese can innovate, but radical innovations, as you rightly say, occur, occur in societies that reward unconventional thinking. Why is unconventional thinking important? Well, unconventional thinking is important for a number of reasons. I mean, something that's unconventional may be unconventional for a reason, which is that, it, you know, simply not a very good idea. But if you have a lot of people that, you know, are uh, uh, prone to think in unconventional ways, and if you have a fairly decentralized economic system uh, with, you know, uh, a lot of different uh, bureaucracies and different sources of funding and uh, different routes to taking that idea to develop the product uh, and a new technology, you're much more likely to have, you know, a few cases uh, of success that develops something that is more radical and that becomes the next big general purpose technology like electricity or the steam engine or artificial intelligence uh, or uh, you name it. And um, so that is the reason why you're more likely to develop something more radical uh, if you're willing to deviate from existing norms and then you have a decentralized economic system. That means that you don't need to ask, you know, one bureaucracy for permission uh, to, you know, get uh, permission to pursue the idea, right? I mean, Soviet Union did launch Sputnik 1 uh, but it did require permission to uh, to pursue the project, and there was only one person that could give permission uh, for that. You know, uh, and uh, if you're in a society where you can uh, get more people and ask for permission, you're more likely uh, to further develop um, an unconventional idea. Yes, as you write, corporate hierarchies based on command and control are good at driving incremental in improvements, such as making production processes more efficient. They are much less likely, though, to foster disruptive innovations that challenge the status quo. Absolutely. And again, I think this goes back to you know, the technology life cycle. So early in the technology life cycle, you want to explore, right? That's why industries tend to be clustered in places like, you know, 20th century Detroit or Silicon Valley today or Renaissance Florence or Victorian Birmingham and Manchester because people go there, they explore, they uh, innovate collectively in a way because they interact uh, in the same community but at the same time pursue uh, their own um, ideas. But when something becomes more standardized and routinized and you move into production and you need to take advantage of economies of scale and scope, you do need uh, managerial hierarchies. And, uh, you know, institutions can be differently good at different things. So if you go back to Britain, who was the leader in the 
first industrial revolution, essentially developed in a very bottom upish way. Then on the continent, you have follower like Germany, which is able to take advantage of its, you know, bureaucratic legacy uh, through Prussian militarism, and, and essentially use that bureaucratic legacy, transfer that to companies like, you know, um, Siemens or AEG, uh, which benefited, you know, uh, uh, to a large extent uh, from uh, the German state bureaucracy in, in terms of being high, uh, able to hire civil servants to build managerial hierarchies that allowed them to scale up uh, production and build, you know, larger companies uh, than uh, British um the british competitors uh were able to do obviously you know there are a number of other factors that play um into this as well um but i think it illustrates the key point which is that you can be a leader in innovation but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're best placed to exploit it and you can be you know very good at exploiting technologies, but they're minishing returns to existing ones. And when you need to develop something new, managerial hierarchies that are sort of built into exploiting one existing technology may not be not so good in creating the new one. All right. And as I said earlier, Carl, I really like your articles. The purpose of this discussion is to attain new insights, but also share your words of wisdom with my audience. And I read, collectivist societies do have an advantage in large scale production and the commercialization due to workers willingness to comply with their managers instructions and work as a team. A factory assembly line cannot run properly if workers question every process, but discouraging deviant behavior has the unfortunate side effect of squelching creativity. Societies that emphasize personal freedom, broadly speaking, take out more patents. They lead when it comes to advancing innovation. Yeah, so I think that essentially underlines what I was just saying, yes. uh, but probably in a better way. Yeah, but I, I just I have to share your writing with our guest. I love this article. You may not have loved it as much as I do, but I really like it. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, Thank you. but Carl, there's another complicated issue, novelty seeking. Novelty seeking predicts innovation and entrepreneurship. However, innovation required an intermediate level of novelty seeking. Some scholars have argued that if we're always engaging in novelty seeking, then obviously we're not producing. So novelty seeking has a downside. I think it's right. I mean, if everybody in a society were just out seeking, looking for novelty, you wouldn't get much done, right? We need people that are able to, you know, arrive at that new idea and be slightly weird uh, and crazy. Uh, and we need people that are able to absorb that idea and make something with it. And that is, you know, as I just said, not uh, necessarily uh, the same person. Uh, you know, that is why the division of labor is quite important. That is why, you know, uh, is really one company alone that is driving progress uh, in a field. That is why, if you look at you know clusters like Silicon Valley, where you see you know William Shockley leaving Fairchild to set up Intel, moving you know out from a bureaucracy, creating a new one, but then giving way to managers to build up a company around that. Um, that's why you saw people like Edison. Uh, sort of creating a wonderful company, but then being forced out because he wasn't the best person uh, to manage it. Um, and um, uh, so, as you say, that diversity um, is highly uh, important. But again, that diversity you're much more likely to find uh, in a society that has some degree of individualism also because their societies tend to be more op open to different types of people. Exactly. And then when you're innovating, you must always aim to serve the market. 
perfect example again is YouTube. Cat videos do well on YouTube. And as such, if one is serious about making money for the short term, do a cat video or an entertainment video. Don't interview academics like yourself. This is a long-term strategy, not a short-term strategy. So when you're innovating, you must be cognizant of your personality traits. Absolutely. And I mean, people innovate for very different reasons. Some people do innovate for profit, others innovate for altruism. Um, <clears throat> some innovate out of uh, pure curiosity. But, you know, once something is in the, the domain, uh, public domain, it also means that there are a lot of people with different ideas that are potentially able to exploit it, right? I mean, if you take a technology like artificial intelligence, I mean, these days, you know, there seems to be uh the sort of standard narrative is that the place that has the most data is going to lead in, in artificial intelligence but you know if it was all about data and not about uh you know um innovation uh, then we would have seen a lot more progress in uh, the field by now right we've seen i mean an explosion in uh, the sort of uh, uh, um, size of data sets um, available for machine learning scholars. But at the same time, we see productivity growth in decline. Very few firms have adopted some sort of artificial uh, intelligence uh, technologies. And the truth is that AI does well in certain domains, but not so well in others. It's very bad at learning with small data sets, for example, something that humans are very good at. And I think if you want to you know, get real progress in the field of artificial intelligence, you need something similar to James Watt's separate condenser, right? I mean, what James Watt did, and the reason why we think of James Watt as the inventor of the steam engine rather than Thomas Newcomen, is that James Watt made it energy efficient. In a similar way, we need a lot of innovation to make uh, you know, artificial intelligence more data efficient to be able to apply it to tasks like, you know, emptying a dishwasher, which you can't run a million trials for uh, the algorithm to learn, right? And, and I think, you know, we have this uh, notion that because China has a very um, significant disregard for data privacy, uh, it is going to lead uh, in AI, but in fact, we're still sort of in the ex exploratory phase of artificial intelligence, where there is a variety of branches within the field taking very different approaches and the decentralized system that allows more people to pursue um, different, different approaches uh, in artificial intelligence is much more likely to be able to produce a meaningful radical innovation uh, that takes us to that actually being the next general purpose technology. All right. A perfect counter example is the case of the US. American students are not top performers on the PISA exam, but it's, it is still the world leader in innovation. Yeah. So I think, first of all, um, I think lagging in PISA is a bad thing. And, you know, the United States needs to uh, change trajectory there. But at the same time, and this is a domain which I'm worried as well. You know, United States has benefited a lot from having a top institutions and b openness to for talent to come to the United States and take advantage of um, the resources um, and the capacity of its leading research institutions. And right now, the United States is looking less open to uh, immigration than it has been uh, historically. And as you say, at the same time, you see that you know the schooling system is not performing very well. There is a lot of research to suggest that you know um, people that become inventors tend to have either parents who were inventors or they grew up in communities uh, where there is an abundance of inventors, right? So if you want to become an entrepreneur or an inventor, you need to be exposed to it as sometimes in your life. Otherwise, you're not going to uh, learn that that's sort of a path uh, that you can take. And if 
we have a lot of people performing poorly in school and not having the chances to then proceed to college or go into fields where they might be more exposed to innovation and entrepreneurship, um, that is going to be a real problem. So I am very worried about that. Exactly. Af an affluent mindset impacts innovation and entrepreneurship and some working class people reside in communities that are a bit hostile to the affluent mindset where mindset is reflective of the scarce of a, of a scarcity outlook and this could be one of the reasons why some minority groups in america do not do as well in entrepreneurship yeah, I mean, you have the studies of Otto Geller and others as well showing that, you know, all the manufacturing cities do quite poorly in innovation today, precisely because, you know, parents tend to give their children the traits that they think are helpful for the jobs that exist. And, you know, Pittsburgh, for example, with its old you know, large steel mills and so on, has been particularly bad at creating new innovators and entrepreneurs. Uh, partly because of that reason, but much more broadly, you see that same story all across Europe, um, and the United Kingdom, and uh, so on, right? So what it means is essentially that the communities that have suffered from deindustrialization uh, are lagging even further behind uh, as a consequence, and we don't have an educational system that is um, able to, to change uh, trajectory. A case in point is Black America. The wages of Black Americans have risen. Black Americans are not doing as poorly as how some would want us to assume. But for the most part, due to the history of slavery and then segregation, Black Americans, even upper class Black Americans, they are less individualistic than white Americans. And they're also skeptical of institutions and skeptical of white people. So one writer, Maya Beasley, she argues in her book that Black students should network more with non-Black students. But I'm assuming that due to the complicated history and slavery in the United States, Black Americans are lowering openness to ideas and new people. And this has implications for innovation in the black community. I haven't seen the studies that you're referring to, but I mean, it's definitely true that segregation, for example, uh, creates some very, very uh, severe hurdles within the collective brain. And it means that, you know, society is not taking full advantage uh, of its human potential, which is a shame on many levels. Yes, because Africans are less individualistic than Europeans, African Americans are the descendants of Africans and during their time in America, they have experienced immense discrimination, so they would have an incentive to be skeptical of society. No, I, I, I think that's right. And I, you know, I think it, you know, explains, um, you know, why some development policies uh, also sometimes uh, don't work. If somebody, you know, uh, a stranger comes to you and say, you know, take this medicine, it's good for you, and you don't know that person, and there's been a history which suggests that, you know, you have good reasons to be skeptical about what strangers uh, tell you, then uh, those patterns are likely to persist. All right, Carl. So another pointed question. How can laggards cl close the gap? Should they innovate or adopt foreign technologies? Well, I mean, you can grow very rapidly by adopting technologies developed uh, elsewhere. And that is what, you know, China and South Korea, Japan, but also, you know, continental Europe uh, did during the uh, first industrial revolution. It's also, by the way, what uh, America did uh, early on when, you know, people like Samuel Slater came over from the United States uh, memorizing, you know, the uh, uh, memorizing the blueprints uh, of the Arkwright Mill, uh, because at the time with the Navigation Act, you were not uh, allowed to export technology, but then setting up factories in the United States and, you know, allowing those regions to catch up. And um, obviously the introduction of the power loom in the United States gave a big boost to manufacturing industry uh, and um, closed the gap 
uh, to Britain. So historically, uh, you know, adapting new technology has been the way to go. But the closer you get to the frontier, the more important innovation becomes. Uh, you know, as the case of Japan uh, suggests in post-war years, you can get a very long way by, you know, incrementally improving production processes and doing what Western companies had done, but slightly better and more efficiently. Um, but at some point that approach runs into diminishing returns. And you know, something I can see very clearly in the patent data is that Japan, for example, in computer hardware, caught up with the United States very rapidly, but it then completely missed the emergence of the software industry, uh, which was also a very localized sort of bottom-up tr up transition, which happened uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, but not in Japan. And, you know, uh, the MITI and uh, Japanese bureaucrats, they couldn't really plan for the emergence of the software industry uh, there because very few people thought that that would really be uh, uh, quite decoupled uh, from uh, the from computer the computer hardware uh, industry. So uh, the closer you get to the frontier, the more uncertain uh, technology becomes. The harder it is to plan, and the more important it is to innovate um in order to grow yes and your assessment of japan is accurate and i will be sharing it for the audience japan failed to make the transition in part because of its lack of openness to outsiders a common characteristic of collectivist societies for example japan's restrictive immigration policies and its long history as an ethnically homogeneous society made it difficult to import talent to compensate for its shortage of skilled software engineers. The US, meanwhile, benefited from being open to immigration. A recent study published by the National Bureau of Economic Research credits immigration with having a positive impact on innovation in the United States as measured by the number of patents granted. Sounds like something I could have written, no? <laughs> yes, very eloquent. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. And that, that, that is indeed very much what I was, what was trying to say earlier. Yeah, but um, what's, what's, what I find fascinating about immigration in the US is that immigrants from Europe are innovative and immigrants from East Asia are also immigrants are also innovative. When people say that immigration is associated with entrepreneurship and economic growth, they're usually referring to East Asian immigrants and European immigrants. I have not seen much data on Latin American immigrants or African immigrants. Um, I'm not uh, sufficiently familiar with the literature on that, to be honest with you. I haven't seen much work on that uh, either. I do know that, you know, Russian academics moving to and the United States, for example, uh, tend to be very good. And, you know, there's obviously when you migrate, there's fusion between, you know, uh, the heritage you bring and the people that you meet and interact with as well. Um, but um, I, I, I have to confess, I, I haven't seen much on, uh, on African Americans and um, Latin Americans. Yes, uh, yes, I agree. So, Carl, in your article, there's another caption titled The Obedience Trap. What is the obedience trap? So, the obedience trap is a phrase coined by uh, two. Uh, Harvard economist originally, Philip Caprenta, and another uh, economist whose name currently uh, escapes me. And what they argue in that paper is that uh, when uh, you specialize in routine manufacturing uh, production, uh, you very much benefit. And this is quite similar to the uh, paper by Otto Galore, Flowers of Evil as well, um, is that when you specialize in routine production, you acquire a set of skills and cultural traits 
uh, that are helpful for that and you're eager to pass that on to the next generation but you know when a technology shock happens like the computer revolution which sort of makes uh, production more flexible and decentralized and which favor a different uh, set of cultural traits and uh, your uh, the the cultural traits you're acquired are very slow moving and that means that you can get stuck in you know uh, traits that are good for earlier production technologies but not very helpful for the technology shock and the transition you're currently been going through which means that you're likely to fall behind let's divert to china carl in your piece you argue that the big tech firms in china are not like the american firms made in china 2025 initiative while U.S. technology companies like Alphabet, Amazon, Facebook, and Microsoft are truly global, their Chinese competitors, Alibaba, Sina, is it W-E-I-B-O, Weibo or Weibo? Weibo, I think. Yeah, Weibo have struggled to grow beyond China's borders. True, Huawei has done better, but if China wants to lead in innovation, the real question is not why, what, how do you pronounce this again? Why? Weibo. No, not, not Weibo, Huawei or Huawei. Uh, Huawei. Yeah, why, Huawei. Huawei, yeah. Yeah, Huawei. The real question is not why Huawei emerged, but why China doesn't have a dozen Huaweis. Yes, exactly. So obviously, Korea did much better after 30 years in that regard, having you know a handful of uh, companies uh, able to uh, compete in global markets. Um, no, I mean, first of all, clearly, these tech giants in China benefit from you know having uh, uh, access to a huge domestic market that no other tech company uh, has access to. Um, in addition to that, though, obviously, um, um, we have an increasing divide in terms of, you know, Chinese tech companies covering China, U.S. tech companies co covering the U.S. and Europe, um, and you know, those companies competing for export markets elsewhere. And China has certainly not fared as well. Uh, in that uh, competition. But I think it's uh, to some extent unhelpful to just focus on these tech giants because in the end of the day, most of these Chinese companies are replicas of some of their you know, US uh, predecessor exactly. companies. Exactly. So Alibaba is essentially you know, uh, the Amazon business model maybe to some extent slightly improved, which goes back to the point I was making earlier about Japan. You know, the Chinese are very good at exploiting new technology and developing it incrementally. And, and there may even be the case that, you know, Chinese companies have a narrow incremental lead in some ways. But, you know, if we want to, um, if we want to understand which country which society is most likely to lead in artificial intelligence i think the question we need to ask ourselves is where do radical innovations come from in the first place what are the sort of conditions in which radical innovation thrives rather than you know looking at trying to co compare uh, amazon or alibaba right i mean it's far from clear that most of these innovations in artificial intelligence is even going to come from Facebook, Google, and Amazon. They may come from smaller startups in, you know, New York or Stockholm or uh, London, for that matter. Uh, you know, we're still very much in the early stages of what you know artificial intelligence potentially has to offer. It's not a mature technology yet. And for that reason, we need to stop uh, treating it um, as such. 
I agree. We still have much to learn about AI. And a recent study done by a Nobel Prize winning economist, he writes that the singularity is a bit far fetched. So maybe we could be overestimating the impact of AI. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the future holds in terms of AI innovation and how long it's going to take, but I'm very much of the view that, you know, progress in the field is not just going to happen by throwing more data and computing resources at the problem. You're going to need some conceptual breakthroughs to make uh, algorithms more data uh, efficient. And, you know, the question we should be asking ourselves, how can we uh, build environments in which that sort of innovation uh, is likely to thrive rather than thinking of how can we protect our own tech giants or how can we make sure that we restrict market access for Chinese tech giants uh, in order to uh, lead in artificial intelligence. Uh, as, as I just said, it's not yet the mature technology and we have to stop treating it as such. But I think that this caveat on, on China is crucial. As you note, Overall, Chinese companies excel at commercializing rather than innovation. According to think tank Marco Polo, 18 of the world's 25 leading AI research institutions companies included are in the United States. And while China has seen an explosion of patents in recent years, most are of a low, most are of low quality. According to international monetary fund data. China remains a major global importer of intellectual property with a 30.2 billion deficit in 2018, much of it with the US. No, that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, a lot of uh, the arguments tend to focus on Chinese patents and there's been tremendous growth in Chinese patents, but local authorities also incentivized uh, applying for a lot uh, of patents and obviously you know uh, as a company uh, that you know uh, is profit seeking you have the incentives of you know often throwing in a lot of claims for your invention into the same patent and you know apply for a stronger patent but you can also you know split those claims into several patents just to inflate the size of your patent portfolio and uh, thereby you know um, uh, apply for a lot of low value or useless uh, patents and you see that you know the uh, likelihood that you know a patentee will pay may pay maintenance fields to maintenance fees to uphold the patent uh, and the probability of that is much lower in china pointing to low quality uh, patents um, and as you mentioned if you look at trade in intellectual property related revenue, which is sort of really the only thing that is a true indicator of the value of your intellectual property, um, then the United States leads by some margin. It's not even close. And probably she is becoming a barrier to technology in China. As you write, she also wants even greater control of the private sector. As China observer Ling Ling Wei wrote, the government is installing more Communist Party officials inside private firms, starving some of credit and demanding executives tailor their businesses to achieve state goals. Yeah, I mean, first of all, as it mentions, a social uh, credit system, which, you know, it's meant to reinforce obedient behavior is not going to make Chinese culture more open to deviance and uh, therefore innovation. So, you know, culturally, that is moving in the wrong direction. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier, the China circles, entrepreneurs and innovators moving in from Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, the United States, other places, played a tremendous role in Chinese innovation, entrepreneurship and technology in the early days. And that happened through concerted policies 
by the CCCP to, you know, create special economic zones. And they did a lot of, you know, horizontal policies to develop infrastructure and invest in education and so on. But it wasn't that China developed through some grandiose uh, plan uh, and developed very much in the bottom up um, fashion in that regard. Uh, China is now paradoxically as it's gets closer to the world technological frontier, moving in the opposite direction and centralizing a lot of innovation, trying to get greater control uh, over uh, uh, many of these companies, as you just mentioned, but also not doing that much to develop the uh, rule of law, which you know allows entrepreneurs that are not attached to the party um, and uh, that are, you know, um, have good ideas that they want to pursue and makes it harder for them because um, there are significant barriers um, to entry. Um, so, yes, the paradoxical thing about China is that it's becoming more now centralized as it's approaching the world uh, technological frontier, which is the opposite of what you should be doing. Innovation is unpredictable. It is not directed by the state apparatus. It, it very much is. I mean, obviously, it would be uh, a bit of an oversimplification to say that it's never been directed by the state uh, apparatus. Obviously, Sputnik 1 is an example, but it's more of an engineering effort uh, than it is sort of, you know, widespread innovation. And clearly, you know, um, there have been a number of cases where societies like Soviet Union, for example, developed a few, you know, very advanced islands in another words, backward sea. But, you know, if you want to grow, you need fairly broad based entrepreneurship across a wide variety of sectors in the economy. You need people willing to take bold bets and you need you know vcs and angel investors and others to you know put uh, some of their own skin in the game uh, on those uh, bets right so because technological change is unpredictable you need to hedge to your bets and you do that by having a very broad pool of inventors and entrepreneurs betting on what they think uh, is the right direction. If you have one by, uh, bureaucracy or a few where you try to pursue some well-defined um, ideas, yes, you may create some advanced industries in the backward sea, but it's not going to yield broad-based prosperity. Exactly, and research suggests that the private sector is better at allocating R&D information to spur innovation. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the most important thing is that you have a decentralized, um, diversified system. So I think, you know, back in... Um, in the 1880s, for example, or the 1870s with the you know, second industrial revolution, a lot of that was driven in the United States by you know, solo inventors. And you had you know, corporations like AT&T had their patent departments were essentially focused on sourcing technology from independent inventors and then incrementally develop that. Today, we don't have you know, that many independent inventors because Part of the reason is technology is more complex, but part of the reason um, uh, is also that you know it's 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 risky business. But we do have a lot of people inside universities that are pursuing a lot of you know uh, more uh, unconventional hypotheses from time to time. Some of that is privately funded. Some of that is funded by the government. I think the focus has been far too much on whether you know it's privately or publicly funded. I think it's more about you know whether the funds are distributed in a decentralized or centralized manner. 
yes, innovation is more likely to be centri it's more likely to be decentralized than centralized because for the most part, innovation is a spontaneous event. It can be planned, but it's spontaneous in that we don't know the next big innov innovation in the future. That's exactly right. So Carl, we have been speaking for a while. And before I go, I would like for you to promote your book, The Technology Trap. Where can we get it? Thank you very much for that opportunity. So I think you can get it. Um, well, you can most certainly get it at Amazon. And if you don't want to get it at Amazon, you can go to the Princeton University Press website and order it directly from there. You may be able to get it in your local uh, bookshop, although uh, I'm not uh, so sure about that. You can get it at Blackwell's here in Oxford if you happen to be in Oxford. But you know, uh, there are a couple of bookshops that have it. So thank you for, for giving me that opportunity. All right. So it was a pleasure to speak to you, Carl. But unfortunately, I have to go. So bye. My pleasure. Thanks very much. Bye.